pleasure to be here. Um, and I've really enjoyed the discussions so far, and the talks have been very good. So hopefully I can uh, add to the course. So I've been asked to talk about electronon fractures, firstly. Uh, why is sutures or plates? So let's get into that. So um, remember that electronon fractures form part of the proximal ulna, and these proximal ulna fractures are actually part of a spectrum, and I'm going to talk about that in a subsequent talk but we're gonna concentrate on electronon fractures. And probably, I'm not a big fan of classification systems too much, but um, the classification that's quite useful for electronon fractures is the Mayo classification. And this basically divides them into stable or unstable. And um, we'll expand on that. When we're trying to decide which fixation to use for a particular electronon fracture, I'm really asking two questions. Is there ulnar humeral instability? And is there significant articular comminution? And don't forget, does it actually need fixing? Because electronon fractures, we can treat non-operatively. But we're going to talk about fixation because that's more, that's more interesting. So how do we know if there's ulnar humeral instability? There's a few ways you can see from an x-ray. So one is to look at this anterior V sign where the trochlea is driven down into the electronon and you'll just see this subtle um, sliding down of the trochlea. You can look at the uh, dorsal cortex and see the relationship between the two and that will give you an inference that the um, humerus is trying to drive through the electronon. And of course the radiocapitellar alignment, although this is known to be a fairly unreliable um, a landmark. We always look at the uh, lateral views, but don't forget the AP view. And if you look at the AP view, sometimes there will be obvious evidence of ulnar humeral instability. So this is a case where actually the MCL has been damaged as well. And the patient, um, if you treat that with, uh, in, a, in a simple manner, you may have problems. And that's because essentially the humerus is trying to um, bombard its way through the electronon in this mechanism. So we have two types. We have one where the humerus is driving through the electronon and axial compression and other attention failures. And so remember that the more oblique the fracture, the more comminuted the fracture, the more distal the fracture, the more likely it is to be an axial loading mechanism and something that's not suitable for tension band wiring or suture repair. Intraoperatively, it's always useful. This is what I do intraoperatively. Always check for ulnar humeral instability. So I'm seeing if the uh, uh, humerus will actually drive through or not. And in this case, it's not driving through, which tells us the ligaments are intact and they've not been stretched, and this is a stable situation. We obviously look for articular comminution, and I'm a, very, I'm a big proponent of getting CT scans if there's any sort of articular comminution. It just gives you a more thorough understanding and allows you to learn and plan your surgery better. And the problem is if we fix these uh, fractures with a tension band wiring or suture method, the, the electronon fixation can't resist those ongoing axial forces and comminution, and we get failures. So what are the indications for attention band wiring? No articular comminution, a fairly transverse fracture, and no ulnar humeral instability. These are the same indications as for a suture repair technique. And in my practice, because of that, um, tension band wiring is not something I use anymore. It's not that, and I'll tell you why. Um, there's some question as to whether tension band wiring actually um, provides compression. You know the principle of tension band wiring, but there's some a debate as to whether it actually um, provides compression through the full arc of motion. Um, it's not technically a completely straightforward procedure. And this uh, paper from um, the uh, German group they showed multiple errors over, over 200 cases within the uh, surgery. So it's not necessarily something that's easy and reproducible to perform. And if we look at the evidence in randomized control trials, the complication rate with tension band wiring is between um, 30 and 60% across many studies. And that's really not because of failure of the fixation method, but because of the need to remove metalwork. 
So um, I've gone over for those particular fractures towards a tension suture repair that was really described by Adam Watts, and, and I helped him uh, describe that. So I'll show you that repair if you haven't seen it. This is in a cadaveric study, so uh, in a cadaveric model. So, um, and it's really just to show you the order of the sutures. It's a very easy, quick technique that can be performed. In reality, uh, we use a clamp to compress, uh, to compress the electronon, and the sutures are really neutralizing the compression. Here, this is just to show you the passage of sutures. So the first sutures, the sutures always go from lateral to medial. Um, they grasp the medial triceps, and then they come back through the transverse tunnel, which is the same as you would do for tension band wiring. And then they grasp the, the lateral triceps, and it's important to really feel the bone uh, through the tenderness uh, insertion. The reason the sutures always initially pass from lateral to medial is to provide so the knots remain away from the ulnar nerve. And this first set of sutures basically is analogous to you carrying a big box. If you're moving house, you're carrying a box like this, and, and it's pulling the, the box towards you, or the fractured er electronon. And then the second set of sutures, again, starts is, is more like a, a Chinese finger trap. So it's going, it crosses over and forms a crisscross pattern. Um, and really, uh, this is the sort of uh, the tension band part of it, and you can see how it will close up. So it's a very quick, uh, simple thing to do, and this is an intraoperative example. So the clamp is on, we've passed the sutures, and then we must e-weigh it to make sure it doesn't gap in any position. If it happens to gap, it can be repeated in 10 minutes or changed to a plate without any issues. So the pearls of getting this technique right are to select the right patients, as with any operation. Um, the placement of the transverse hole should be volar enough that it doesn't fracture through. And then um, grasping the triceps carefully. It can be used for electronon osteotomies if you do osteotomies, but beware that we've found the healing time for osteotomies is longer, probably because we remove some bone and it's an artificial fracture. And if, if you have to use it for an osteotomy, consider passing a third suture around to supplement it. When we compared in our own institute uh, the results, we, we, we looked at 138 type 2 Mayo fractures, and we essentially found that the suture technique had a much lower complication rate, significantly lower than tension band wiring. And again, the tension band wiring was metalwork removal or prominent, and also lower than plate for the same fracture time. And this is a, a study that's been ongoing in the UK. It's called the SOFT trial. So it's comparing tension band wiring with suture repair. And we've just finished recruitment um, of 280 patients. So probably by this time next year, the results will be available. So when do we do plates? So we're going to use plates for the unstable um, type 2 fractures or highly comminuted fractures that may also be unstable. But plates have problems. We can get fragment escape, plate prominence, or wound breakdown. And if you've done any amount of electronon fractures, you will have seen these complications. They've happened to all of us. One technique is to use parallel plates. And uh, you have the Medatis plates at the back. These are the plates um, we often use, particularly in uh, older patients where they have a much worse soft tissue envelope, especially in women who have very slim arms, um, it can be nice to avoid the plate prominence. And these, these can provide a raft under the articular surface. It's a slightly different concept in the way you fix them, but a nice tool to have. Dorsal plates are brilliant for supporting the axial forces and articular comminution, and um, that, that's the traditional way of fixing these with plates. Beware of a few things if you're using a plate. Have a look at this fracture. This is a, a very typical fracture line that you see, a little hidden fracture line. And frequently, screws will be placed through that fracture line and beware you can displace the fracture. So I liberally, even if we're using plates, I use sutures to reduce the fracture and maintain everything, and then the plate to neutralize the triceps. So in this case, when I revised it, we, you can see the intraoperative image. Actually, with sutures, it's perfectly stable. So just revising it with sutures is good. But we then go on to use plates to neutralize that because it's a revision surgery. 
Also beware of screws that impinge on the PRUJ. I've seen this and had to take screws out, uh, stiffness and pain that happens because of this. So one thing to do is always get x-rays where you can see the PRUJ at the end of the case. You have to rotate the arm quite a bit to get the, that shoot through view. And you want to avoid screws that are going into this area like that and focus your x-ray on that area, sorry. Always make sure at the end that you feel rotation, there's no clicking, catching at all, really important. Also avoid widening the greater sigmoid notch. This is a common mistake when there's very fragmented fractures. We're looking at the dorsal surface of the electronon and you guide your reduction on the back and we forget to take x-rays to look at the articular side. And if you widen this uh, electronon fossa, you'll get this, um, the humerus seesawing inside and it leads to rapid arthritis. So beware of that. And with any proximal ulnar surgery, remember that there's quite substantial variation in the anatomy of the proximal ulna. And these plates that we use are one size fits all. So on occasion, your plate won't fit the proximal ulna, and at worst, it can cause a deformity. So just be aware, if something's not fitting correctly, think about the patient's anatomy might be different. And then I know we were only talking about plates, sutures, and wires, but it's also worth mentioning uh, screws and these are quite good. If I ever do an electron on osteotomy, which is fairly uncommon, then my preference is to use screws and we pre-drill those. Technical tip if you're using screws, that remember the proximal ulna is not a straight bone, so it's got a various angulation. You need to offset the entry point uh, laterally in order to go down the middle of the ulna. If you, if you go down the middle of the electronon or medially, as the screw engages, it will cause gapping somewhere in the fixation. And don't forget non-operative treatment. It's, um, it's amazing the results of non-operative treatment in older patients that don't require um, their extensor function, but only for stable type 2 fractures. So choose the correct indications, suture or tension band wiring for Mayo type 1 and 2 and plate fixation for type 2 and 3. And hopefully I've given you some pit common pitfalls to avoid. Thank you.